Carmel Tebbett has had quite a diverse um, um, past, and she's done many, many different things, particularly when she was in politics. Um, of course, um, she's currently the CEO of Medical Deans Australia and New Zealand, the professional body representing early entry level medi uh, medical education, training and research here in Australia and over in New Zealand. Prior to taking on this role, Karma was a member of the New South Wales Parliament for 17 years, serving in both the Legislative Council and as, an, as the member for Marrickville. Karma was appointed to the Ministry in 1998 and held many portfolios, but to mention a few, health, education, community services and the environment. She was the very first woman to be appointed Deputy Premier in New South Wales, our great state, in 2008. Carmel's key ministerial achievements include the National Health Reform Negotiations, which meant significant additional funding for New South Wales, legislating a mandatory energy efficiency target, the River Red Gum Forest Agreement, the Best Start Program to improve our young children's transition to school and reform of child protection programs, providing new resources and a stronger focus on early intervention, intervention for these particular services. Now, apart from all that, she's a thoroughly lovely lady. I welcome her to the rostrum. Um, well, good afternoon to everyone and, and thank you, uh, Virginia, my former colleague from the New South Wales Parliament for, um, for your introduction. And it is wonderful to be here today at the Australian Lebanese Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I very much appreciate the introduction. Uh, can I acknowledge Your Excellency, Consul General, the President, Joe Qatar, Joe Risk, the President of the Westmead Research Institute, ALCC directors who are here, my former parliamentary colleague, Virginia Judge, former Chief Justice, Margaret Beasley, wonderful that you're here and a former speaker at this lunch. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Mayor John Faker, who is here. And uh, I also want to acknowledge my former council colleague, Barry Cotter, former Mayor of Marrickville. And Barry and I served on Marrickville Council many, many years ago, but uh, uh, I still have contact with Barry and it's great to see Barry here. Um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we stand on and pay my respects to elders. I think it is particularly important that we do that in a week where we have just commemorated the 1967 referendum. Thank you uh, for the invitation to come and speak with you today. And I want to congratulate the Australian Lebanese Chamber of Commerce for your work in promoting trade and understanding between Australia and Lebanon, and also uh, for holding lunches such as this, providing the opportunity to discuss and debate ideas and issues, which I think is so very important. And when I look at the lineup of past speakers, it's uh, very impressive. So I'm, I'm honoured to be uh, a part of that list. Um, I want to particularly acknowledge the women in the audience today. It is the Women's Luncheon and I want to pay tribute to uh, the achievements of all the women who are here today. And in doing so, I want to invoke uh, Dame Mari Bashir, who, a woman of Lebanese heritage, who has done so much for our state and our country. And I know Mari has been a guest on previous occasions here, but she's someone who I hold in very high esteem and I think uh, is held in high esteem by the community. So the title of my speech today is um, why, social why Socially Inclusive Communities and Societies Matter. And I chose this topic in part uh, because I'm very uh, committed and passionate about socially inclusive societies, but also because when Nadia first approached me to speak at the luncheon today, the French election was underway and at that point the National Front's Marine Le Pen was making massive gains in the polls. And I, like many others, felt a deep concern that the country, which in so many ways I think epitomises liberal thinking and inclusion, 
could contemplate electing someone so divisive as their president. So it got me thinking about what drives people, often against their own economic interests, to embrace populist politicians, people who present very simplistic solutions to what are very complex problems. And while I'm pleased that Emmanuel Macron was ultimately successful in France and the threat of a Le Pen presidency has subsided for the moment, the fact is that the appeal of populist politics still remains and I do think it's something that we need to engage with and I think it's timely to look at the issue of social inclusion and why it matters and also, I guess, what practically we might be able to do to support Australia to become a more socially inclusive and equal society. And I say socially inclusive and fairer because I do think that the two are inextricably linked. When I talk about a socially inclusive society, I mean inclusion based on race, religion, gender and sexuality, but I also mean inclusion on the basis of economic participation because economic inequality, poverty and disadvantage both exclude people, but they also provide the basis for others to exploit a fear of difference based on economic insecurity. And inclusion really does matter. It matters not just because it makes a difference to the life of the individual, but it also, as the World Bank has effectively reported, lays the foundation for shared prosperity. And there is a lot of research now that demonstrates that socially inclusive societies do better. Social exclusion and economic inequality impact on growth, they impact on prosperity through reduced demand and also reduced investment in people. And all of this feeds into political, economic and social instability. And yet despite this evidence, we still see in recent political developments that uh, the health and future prospects for socially inclusive societies are somewhat pessimistic. We've seen a rise right around the world in support for populist parties, both Brexit and the election of Donald Trump in the United States relied in large part on populist solutions and fanning the fear of others. In the UK, of course, the disaffection with the free movement of people under the European Union rules and the impact that this had on the British labour market was a key factor in why Britain chose to exit the European Union. And in the United States, the alienation of a predominantly white, disenfranchised working class Americans from the so-called rust bucket states was shamelessly exploited by Donald Trump. He promoted division and exclusion in his pitch to make America great again. Now, there is a lot of debate in the United States and elsewhere about the extent to which race and class played a role in the Trump victory. But I think it's no doubt that what we see with the election of Donald Trump was the ultimate political outcome of a society that wasn't able to adequately address economic inequalities and cultural resentments. And I think there is a price to be paid for that. In the United States, what I think we see is the election of someone who I would argue is poorly equipped for that most important role in our world order. We've also seen, of course, in Australia that we have experienced our own rise in populism. We've seen support for One Nation and they mine the insecurities of people who have seen the rough end of economic change. And while One Nation might be having some of their own difficulties at the moment, it would be, I think, a brave commentator who would write them off with the Queensland election just around the corner. And we've already seen, I think, unfortunately, the impact of One Nation in some of the recent debates, whether it be the debate about 18C and the Racial Discrimination Act or changes to the citizenship test, there has been this undercurrent of antagonism to the other, to those newly arrived in Australia. And I think this is in no small part fuelled by the very unacceptable and extreme rhetoric of One Nation. The Brotherhood of St Lawrence, which is an organisation well known for the work it does amongst disadvantaged communities, has developed what they call a social exclusion monitor. And they've used data from the Household Income and Labor Dynamics in Australia survey. Now, the most recent data shows that around 25% of Australians aged 15 years and above 
have experienced some level of social exclusion. 20% were marginally excluded, 5% were deeply excluded, and 1% very deeply excluded. Now that's a lot of people in a country that likes to think of itself as egalitarian. The truth is that we do tolerate quite significant disparities in wealth and inequality in Australia. The Smith Family is another organisation that does a lot of work with disadvantaged communities. And a story was told by their CEO, Lisa Smith, about a teacher from a high school in the outer suburbs of Sydney. And I think this puts a human face to what I'm talking about with social exclusion. So this teacher set what she thought was a relatively simple project for her high school students. She asked her students to interview their parents, their mum or their dad, about the job they do, what they do, how they got into it, what the qualifications are they need to do that job. And she was a bit puzzled by the look of concern and confusion on the face of her students until one of them put up their hand and said, Miss, what if your mum and dad don't have a job? And she said, oh, well, that's OK. Interview someone in your neighbourhood, your next-door neighbour or someone in your extended family. And the student then said, but what if you don't know anyone who has a job? And it turned out that in this teacher's class, only two students knew someone who had a job, who was in employment. Now, I tell this story not because I want to pass judgment on those students and their families, but to illustrate what we are up against when we say we want a more socially inclusive society. Those young people, and many like them, growing up in communities without a culture of work, face enormous challenges in getting a job. They have little notion of what it means, they don't have the contacts that are so often helpful in landing your first job, and they just don't have that experience and culture of work in their families, and it makes a huge difference. So if the rise of populism is a warning sign to mainstream political parties to realise their mistakes and change course, then I think it's a warning sign that we need to heed here in Australia. I do think we have to work harder to build a more socially inclusive society, one that's based on respect for each other and trust in society's institutions, and that delivers real jobs and economic opportunities for everyone. It has to provide good access to quality public services like education, health, transport, social services, so that people can realise their full potential and can live a life of dignity irrespective of their background or the background of their parents. It is an inclusive society that celebrates differences while understanding that it's our basic humanity that unites us. In Australia, there are many ways, don't get me wrong, there are many ways that we are inclusive there are many things that we can be proud of. Multiculturalism has been the great success story for Australia. For many years, I represented the seat of Marrickville in the Parliament of New South Wales. It is one of the most diverse electorates in the state. And Marrickville saw waves of migrants very successfully make it their home. And on the whole, the older, predominantly white working class population were um, positively adapted to this change, were accepting of this change. And it is an experience that has been repeated writ large in suburbs and towns right across Australia. But I do also remember the Cronulla race riots. They weren't that long ago. I grew up in the Sutherland Shire, so I felt a particular distress in seeing those race riots. I see the casual racism that Indigenous Australians still often, to, um, still often experience. And I also see the shameful way that we've sometimes responded to those refugees coming from other places, trying to make it to our shores. So while we have made a lot of progress and we are right to be proud of that progress, there is still very much a fragility to our social inclusion. As Michael Kirby, the former High Court judge, described it, there's that great fear of the stranger which lurks in our national psyche. So sustaining a genuinely inclusive society does require constant commitment an action to ensure that the challenges that are ripping the social compact apart overseas do not occur here. So we need to focus our policies and our services on the places and groups where social exclusion is most mattered. The students that I spoke about earlier, those uh, suburbs in Western and southwestern Sydney and other parts of Australia. We need to redouble our efforts to keep young people in education and to ensure 
that economic growth delivers good jobs and that for those people who can't access those jobs, there's a strong social safety net. A quality education system is, of course, essential. It has to provide the best possible education for all students, irrespective of their background. It needs to kindle in those students a deep love of learning and to lay the foundation for a successful transition to adulthood. And we have to invest in higher education and vocational training so that people can have lifelong opportunities to learn and to also uh, upgrade their skills as they move through their career. We know that education is a path out of disadvantage for so many, but there are still too many who don't find this path. And what can often happen is they become disenfranchised, alienated from mainstream communities with all of the potential impacts that this has on our ability to be socially inclusive. And I think that's why the original Gonski funding model is so important because it funds schools according to need so that they can provide support for students irrespective of the income of their parents. And if we look at school results in Australia, we do see that success is still far too predicated on the socioeconomic background of your parents rather than your own um, attitudes and aptitudes. So if our schools can't be a, mean, a, a genuine means of economic and social advancement, it does have a real impact on social cohesion. But of course it's not just about education, it's also about leadership in support of multiculturalism and inclusion. That's critical. We need our politicians, our community leaders, our business leaders to, to demonstrate this. Uh, in the 70s, we saw Australia very successfully accept many, many refugees from Vietnam. Many made Marrickville their home. And this couldn't have happened without the political leadership and the courage of Malcolm Fraser. And we need to see more of that. When Malcolm Turnbull first became Prime Minister, I took heart from what I thought was a, a changed language, particularly his commitment to work with the many communities that make up our multicultural society. However, we've recently seen our Prime Minister adopt, when talking about citizenship and Australian values, what some have described as a more muscular tone, but which in effect can often demonise migrants and refugees. And I think that's very unfortunate because in these debates, language really does matter. It has an incredibly important role, or politicians have an incredibly important role in framing the debate and defining what is and isn't acceptable. And that's a power that needs to be used very wisely and very carefully. And we also need meaningful legislation, which doesn't allow people to be humiliated on the basis of their race, and which promotes and protects community harmony. So the final facet of an inclusive society that I wanted to address today is also gender inclusiveness, because I think that is so important. While ever we have women underrepresented in positions of power, whether it be in our parliaments or our businesses or our universities, then we cannot be a genuinely inclusive society. And when women, and when women earn on average 16% less than men, when women make up about 16% of our CEOs in Australia and 22% of the federal cabinet, then I think Australia can do a lot better. And I think we must do a lot better. Part of the answer, and it's not the whole answer, but certainly part of the answer, is a stronger commitment to family-friendly workplaces. If our workplaces make it hard for those with primary childcare responsibilities to advance, then we will continue to see the unequal representation of women. And family-friendly policies are not just good for women, they're good for men too, and most importantly, they're good for kids. A workplace culture that's inflexible, that expects excessively long hours at the desk and doesn't provide adequate maternity and paternity leave is unhealthy for everyone. And the attitude an organisation's management takes to work-life balance is crucial for their employees. I spent many years, particularly as a minister, juggling work-life family balance, so I understand the issue. And I also accept that my circumstances, particularly when I was a minister, are somewhat unusual. The life of a minister provides very little flexibility. Uh, but what I did see when we had a woman become the Premier of the state 
was a real difference in my ability to juggle my work-life family responsibilities. When Christina Keneally became the Premier, it was things that she, as a working mother, understood that we were all experiencing, such as not routinely scheduling early morning meetings because she knew that we were all trying to get our kids off to school in the morning, such as having her own children come into Parliament House after school. She would do those things, small gestures, but they made a difference because they sent the message that it was acceptable to try and balance work-life family responsibilities. So time today doesn't allow me to address all of the other actions that I think are necessary to build and support a socially inclusive society, things like quality job creation, investment in infrastructure, but I do believe that it is timely to reaffirm our commitment to an inclusive society and that this requires a concerted effort from all levels, from both individuals and also from institutions. It's both political action and also personal action. Because as the former Army Chief, David Morrison, so famously said, it's the behaviour that you walk by that is the behaviour you accept. And I think there is a lot at stake. As the American experience shows, the seeds of success for populism are sown when people are marginalised and disenfranchised and eventually they find a way to strike back. And in the US, it was through the election of Donald Trump and I think that has brought some real risks to the stability and prosperity of the world order. So an inclusive society, one that supports people's right to dignity and a decent quality of life, one where people have legitimate ways to realise their economic aspirations and where they value and respect one another is, I think, the strongest inoculation we have against dangerous populism and extremism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carmel, for sharing your insightful and thoughtful words um, from your speech. Um, um, I believe that you're happy to take uh, any questions that might be hovering in people's minds. So if there are any questions, there's a lady over there. <laughs> Could you stand up and... <laughs> um, well, I don't know whether there's a microphone. Oh, here's come. He's on the run. If you wouldn't mind just being patient for a second. Thank you for your time today. In your speech, you mentioned Marine Le Pen, President Trump, and the Cronulla riots. You talked about the white working class and economic disenfranchisement, and sometimes underpinning um, cultural intolerance. However, you did not talk about legitimate grievances that people may have, such as uncontrolled immigration in Europe, and you know, um, trade policies. Do you think that politicians not addressing these legitimate grievances is causing voters to take drastic measures and vote for fascist parties, right-wing parties or nationalist parties? Yeah, I, I, I think that is the point that I'm trying to make, which is that people do have legitimate grievances. And look, I have to be very clear, I'm not... Um, casting aspersions on people who vote, who voted for Donald Trump. That's the democratic process. I have to say, my father is a Donald Trump supporter. So I understand the mindset that, um, that drives people to support politicians like Donald Trump. But I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that unless we find ways to ensure that the benefits of economic growth and globalisation are more fairly shared, and that all people have an opportunity to um, experience a decent quality of life and to uh, have those things that most of us here would take for granted, we are going to see those people vote for politicians who offer very simplistic solutions but appeal to their heart. Uh, and, and that's what I'm, I'm really saying we need to guard against. And I think in Australia we have done quite well. I think in Australia we have a strong social safety net we have had a very successful multicultural society. So I'm, I'm proud of those achievements, but I don't think we should take them for granted. And 
I think we need to realise that there's more we should do. Thank you for your interesting question. Are there any other questions from the floor? Oh, well then, okay. Um, I'd like to say, oh, is one here? Oh, yes. Wonderful. Your Honour. <laughs> Thank you. May I, I first thank you very much. It was, um, I love an intelligent speech. I particularly love an intelligent speech given by an intelligent woman. So, <laughs> um, I wish to make uh, one comment, uh, make, um, share, share something that was told, me to, told the other day and then raise a, one of the you know, hoary old chestnuts for a comment. The first comment is, uh, I work in a place where there is equal pay and I think it makes an extraordinary difference to the nature of the, the workplace. You feel as though your voice is heard because there's no reason to put you down. So I do think that in terms of workplaces generally and productivity, uh, equal pay is an extraordinarily important matter. It's just a personal comment. Second comment is I was um, in my role, I'm able to meet a number of people, including ambassadorial people. Um, and I was um, meeting with the ambassador from Holland recently, and she said she has now changed her mind about quotas in Parliament, female quotas for females in Parliament. She went through thinking, no, we don't need it, women should be able to do it on their own, but she said it's all taken too long, and she has actually come around to thinking it's very important. Do you have a view on that? Um, well, my own experience um, with the Labor Party, which is the party that I represented in Parliament, is that uh, we, for a long time, had various um, aspirations to uh, increase the number of women in Parliament. I remember going to a conference back in the 90s, half by 2000, and I thought that was absolutely a, an achievable goal. But it wasn't until we changed our rules that we found we made real progress. And so I do think that if we want to see more women in Parliament, if we want to see more women on boards and in positions of um, power and influence, then we are going to have to find ways to do that that do involve changing the rules. Now, what we did in the, in, in the Labor Party was introduce loadings for women through the voting system, through the pre-selection system. I think that was quite a good solution because it had the same result of increasing the number of women who successfully contested pre-selections because if it was a tight pre-selection, the woman got a loading of 20% and that both meant that they had a, a better chance of winning that tight pre-selection but it also meant that the factions would put forward women, which is what in the past we'd struggled with because they knew that that was a better way to try and win that seat. Um, so it wasn't quotas as such, but it, it achieved the, the end result. Yes, I do think there is a role for quotas. I think that we have tried long and hard to see an increase in the number of women in positions of power, and we've made some, some gains, but it is still far too slow. I think there's another question coming here. Ah. Carmel, uh, first up, thank you very much. Very, uh, very well done. Um, best practice. So in your opinion, which country in the world does it extremely well? And, and you know, um, we've made some really great improvements over the last few decades in this country. Um, but in your opinion, which country is out there that really has, has taken the, uh, the, the big leap? In terms of social inclusion, yeah, yeah. Um, I think Australia has done very well. So I think we can uh, put ourselves uh, there with, with the leaders. I think we have done very well, but as I said, um, we can't take it for granted. I think if you look at the Scandinavian countries, so whether it be Sweden or Norway, they've certainly done well in the past with the social safety network and the support for women, um, but they've perhaps faltered a little bit more recently. And there's no doubt that since the global financial crisis and the impact that that had on world economies, all, um, all countries have struggled a bit with social inclusion because it does have... Um, th there is a price to it as well. There is a cost to it. I think ultimately the investment 
reaps rewards many times over, but you do need to make that investment. And when countries' economies are struggling and they have um, struggled to um, turn around since the global financial crisis, although we're coming out of that, of course, now, I think that does make it hard. Um, but, yes, I would certainly put Australia up there, uh, but there's more we can do. Do we have any more questions? No. No. OK. Well, look, th thank you very much, Carmel, once again for um, fielding all those questions sort of um, from left centre and right centre and so forth. And, um, and thank you for coming today and for your, for your lovely speech. Thank, thank you. you.